So welcome uh, to DConf, which is kind of a silly thing to say on the second day, excuse me, I'm a bit nervous. Um, I'm going to be talking about the way that we de uh, develop software at Funkwerk. We've been uh, writing D-based software for coming on 10 years now, and I like to think we have gathered some experience with the, not exactly optimal, with a rather effective way to combine the features that D offers into um, a development approach that is appropriate for writing sort of a micro, so semi-microservice-based architecture without running into the uh, plentiful pitfalls that uh, D offers when you're going in the route of long-running services. First of all, a bit of uh, introduction about what exactly is Funkwerk, what exactly, who exactly are we as a company. Uh, a lot of you arrived here by, by tr oh, I'm sorry, I'm standing in the way apparently, I'm being told. Uh, a, lot of you arrived here, a lot of you arrived here by train or by tram or by um, underground rail. And you may have seen an announcement that a certain train was delayed a few minutes because it missed the last station or it, five, five stations ago, it uh, got a bit of a blocker on the, uh, on the rails and it can't be there in time, so you, so you have to take the replacement bus. That is what we do, essentially. The entire chain of data flow in this from the point where the train measures that it's delayed from the point where it doesn't realize, where it realizes that where the station realizes that the train hasn't arrived yet, to the point where you can actually see that information on the display. This is uh, passenger information, and this is our competency. So usually, this, this is not the case that we control the entire chain of data flow from train to display. Usually, it's the case that uh, the customer has their own sensors at the train station, or the customer has their own displays. And so we need to speak with one in a rather large variety of possible protocols, and so in that sense, basically, our job comes down to taking in data either directly from the device or from one of a large number of interesting and hilariously outdated protocols and uh, transforming it into a unified internal domain format, uh, doing some processing on it and hand handing it out again in the format that the customer expects and that the display expects. So uh, for, the, for 10 years, approximately coming on 10 years now, every new backend component in this chain that we've written has been in D, largely D2. So this started out uh, in a place where we were coming from Java, essentially. Rather, we were um, basically, we weren't entirely comfortable with this new language yet. And we wanted to be sure that if it turned out that D was actually secretly really terrible, that we wanted to be able to switch back to Java or switch back to something similar. So our initial code was um, really, really Java-like. So to, to the extent that we actually generated classes from a UML template so we could potentially switch right, straight back to Java if need be. This was not a good idea, even at the time. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> if, you're, if you're having a very long-running service and you read gigabytes of XML of uh, external data and you have to pass that and you have to transform that into an internal format and every single XML node is a class and all of them reference the class above them and reference the children below them. Let me put it like that, we, we bought a lot of memory. <laughs> it was definitely not unusual to see processes in the single or very low double digit percentages of gigabyte. Furthermore, uh, rather demonstrating the point that from the start, classes should really have been non-nullable by default. Every single member of those classes had an invariant that checked, them, checked if they were not null. If we had a constructor, we checked the par parameters if they were not null and start. If we had a function, an, an accessor, we checked if the result was not. There was a lot of boilerplate going around. The further problem is that uh, what we ended up with is already we were trying to go for a microservice architecture. Like, we didn't want a monolithic heap of code. We wanted something where we could work on different components at different times in different teams. The problem is that we were still extremely stateful. Like, every, every time one of those components started up, it had to talk with the services that, were, that, were, that it was trying to interact with, and it had to, get, to bootstrap its state from these services. And there was a lot of bootstrapping involved. It, was, it is not unusual, even now, for a starting service to take half an hour. That's not good. It's really not good, especially if you're supposed to be agile. <laughs> Furthermore, we ran into, the, ran into a problem that we really didn't use in significant amounts of const yet, primarily because, again, coming from Java, there is no const in Java. So uh, we had a lot of distributed code that changed state in a lot of different locations. It was not easy to understand what that code was doing at times. So 
over the past 10 years, we've tried to gradually switch to a sort of proper, better style of doing things. And I'm going to have these slides in the talk with the exclamation mark. Those are my, kind of my rant, my rant slides. Sorry, my, my respect for criticism slides. <laughs> I'm trying to give some pain points that we experience and really highlight where I think that uh, D could be better. Now, when I'm saying D is almost too powerful, this seems like, uh, praise, like praising with faint donation, essentially. And this is like, powerful is good, right? A powerful language is something you want. The problem is that D is so powerful and D is so generic that you can write D in a C style. You can write D in a Java style. You can write D in a C sharp style, even if you want. The problem is that if you write D in a Java style, you're going to, you're going to suffer, essentially. You're going to run into difficulties, and th these difficulties are only going to reveal themselves after you have already invested a potentially very long, very large amount of time in writing in this style. In that sense, specifically for running with, like we did, Java like D with long running processes, the garbage collector, especially on 32-bit where we started out, is going to hurt. Now the, the thing is, it doesn't have to be this way. Like there is good, there is good D in the sense not that, that it's good code, but in the specific sense that it works with the, with the advantages and disadvantages that D has, that it avoids the pain points. And Furthermore, this is also D that looks good. This is also, if you're using ranges, if you're used to using ranges, this functional style, it, it's very, very elegant, very expressive. And I, I think, specifically, there's a, there's a code style guideline for D, but there is no development style guideline for D. Like, there's no sense that you, if you look at the, at the documentation, there's no sense in general of the pain points. Like, there, there are open bugs in the language that have been open for many years that are completely undocumented in the documentation. In a certain sense, the documentation likes to pretend that everything is all right. I think that's a mistake. I think specifically the documentation could say, this is a weak area. If you want to, if you want to be safe, you want to write long running process, you could avoid this. You should write it in this or that sense, this or that way instead. Like push, push structs, push ranges, push no GC. Especially if you're having developers coming from Java, this is not obvious. This is very much not obvious and I think it could stand to be documented a lot better than it is. Coming back to our problem. So um, we actually have a dedicated architect, and this dedicated architect had read recently about domain-driven design, and this was a very good thing for us, because domain-driven design is an architecture that really synergizes well with D. <coughs> now, the problems that we ran into were the plentiful use of global state, and the thing that we did to address this was we tried to very much compress state into a small number of objects and a small number of classes in particular. So one way you can do that is you can try to write your code in a way so that it's impossible to change state or that it's impossible to have idioms that change state except in specific points of, uh, specific points of code. You want to concentrate your, your state changes in a smaller layer of code as possible. Furthermore, we've tried to split our code apart into areas of competency into um, going, by, going by which domain area this code was relevant to, and then actually hard, do hard enforcement of the separation between those layers. The way that this works is, oh, there was supposed to be text in there. Okay, we have some additional font problems. It doesn't matter, no, it's, it's good, it's good. Okay, so this works, is, this, is based, this is pure domain-driven design. The idea of it is that fundamentally you're splitting code approximately in three layers. So you have the protocol layer, which uh, concerns itself with the interactions in between services and the outside. <coughs> Basically, every time you have two services talking to one another or one service talking to the network or talking to a customer, this is protocol. Control is state change. Everything that, every algorithm, every state change is on the control layer. And model, which is a bit weird, is just your domain. Like, the definition of the data in your domain is in the model layer. And the model layer is a lot more important than you give it credit for. I'm gonna go into that in a bit. The, the important part is that protocol can see everything, control can see model, model can't see anything else. Model is pure, it's, it's isolated. And as, furthermore, you, usually when you're talking between domains, we don't have that in, completely internally, but usually you only want data flow in one direction. Basically, when you're looking at this area of code down here, if, when you're looking at model, you don't want to have to think about everything else, anything else. You don't want it to be possible to think about control, you don't want it to be possible to think about protocol. So this is actually hard enforced in our system. We're using the uh, depend library, which one of our developers has written. Uh, and this is a framework where you can actually, well, the ostensible purpose of it is to generate UML diagrams of package dependencies in D. 
But the beneficial aspect of this is that you actually have to specify your dependencies up front. And when your project violates the dependencies, you get a very nice audit error in, uh, in your build system. In your, um, yeah. And um, you, you actually get warned, and you have to explicitly opt in to any dependency that um, isn't already specified. Right. So these three layers I, I mentioned are important because they're different. They're, like, if you're looking at the code in those layers, it's completely different code. It's, there's almost no similarity. And just a sketch. OK, at the protocol layer, every, you have state, but all the state is state from your framework. For instance, you have HTTP state. You have um, JSON RPC state. You have um, whatever XML, JSON, XML, XML RPC state. There's a bunch of options there. But you don't have application state. You don't have anything about your domain. Uh, for those who don't know domain-driven development, I want to throw in here for a moment that the domain is everything that is business logic. Basically, when you're talking about trains, you're talking about domain. When you're talking about requests, you're talking protocol. So in, in the control layer, the second one, this is every, everything that, the everything, every bit of domain logic, every bit of business logic is concentrated here. And specifically what it does is all the state changes, all the algorithms are in this layer. And the model is pure. The model is stateless, which means that nothing in the model mutates anything. Nothing in the model holds any state. The model describes state, but it doesn't mutate it. What this comes down to in D in practice is specifically at the protocol layer, we are taking heavy advantage of uh, templated, boilerplated code. As this leads to something called anemic protocol, I'm, I'm tentatively calling anemic protocol, basically in, a, in, in an internal service, it doesn't have to talk to anything complicated, it just has to talk to other services in the same architecture. Protocol is basically empty. It's just, basic, it's just code that says, I'm connecting to a server on this domain, this, this port, and it implements this interface, and that's it. The, all the rest is generated, all the rest is framework code that you don't have to write, you don't have to worry about. Now, the thing at the control layer, I'm just sketching this right quick, is at this point, all, because all the mutation is concentrated here and because you don't need the protocol to set this up, control is isolated from above, Again, I want to clarify this. In a usual service, product, if control needs to send a message to, uh, to another service, it has, to call a, it has to do a protocol call. It has to do, say something like do an HTTP request to that service. We don't do that. We don't talk about HTTP in the, product, in the control layer. This is basically, we're using something called dependency inversion, where the control layer specifies what sort of calls it wants to be able to make, and it usually does that in form of a class. And this is essentially the only place where we use classes. We basically, the, con the control layer says something like, I want to make a request of this domain, and it does that by specifying an interface with a method. And then the protocol layer implements that interface, because again, the protocol layer can see control. Control can't see protocol. The protocol layer implements that interface and then passes it in when it instantiates the control structure, which makes it very easy to write feature tests because your tests don't have to worry about the networking. It, they can't worry about the networking. Now, at the model layer, this code again looks completely different. We have essentially only structs, only structs and enums down here. Basically, this is, this is effectively plain old data. We wish it was plain old. It isn't plain old data, but it's effectively plain old data structs. That is, uh, structs that have no private state. They are semantically immutable. I wish, again, they used the keyword mutable, but they can't for reasons I'll get into. And they heavily use disable this. Everything down here is domain state. So disable this allows us to avoid it even being possible to create a struct that doesn't uh, fulfill its invariant. Right. Oh, that's the wrong direction. All right. Now I'm going to have a bit of a rant here about uh, structs as value objects. Now what we want is immutable. What we really, really want is to be able to say nothing in here can change state. You can only return a new value. You can't mutate anything. Especially because everything in those structs could be public. We want it to be public. We want the domain level to be transparent because we're not hiding anything down here. The problem with immutable is that it doesn't work. It doesn't work with reduce, with group, and it, most importantly, it does not work with associative arrays. Associative arrays are the single most useful data structure if you're writing domain logic. You need associative arrays, but you can't have them because associative arrays have to do assignment to a key under the same name, potentially in the same data, and if you're using immutable data, that's, nope, can't do that. You should be able to do it, but you can't do it. So essentially, with that, with that single inadequacy alone, immutable has become completely unusable for us. So what we actually, what we thought about this problem, and we said we don't, we don't actually care about data immutability. 
What we care about is semantic immutability. We care about that you can't construct a, a value, a, a struct, and then you mutate it, then you make a change. So what we actually used was private, <laughs> which it goes in, against the entire point of the model layer. You want everything in there to be transparent. So what we're doing is we have private fields, and in every assignment, in every instantiation of a, of a struct, every array that goes into a private field is stopped. Remember how you complained about the garbage collector? Yeah. Okay, this was not nice, but it was necessary. Every time you read from such a field, and it's not a const read, it's not a declared const, it has to be dubbed. So again, you have effectively an immutable field. You can't, you can't mutate it from the outside, you can't mess with it, you can't break it. The other branch of this is um, that we're using a lot of invariants to encode like business dependencies, something like uh, an, a train, the journey between stations has to contain at least one station, stuff like that. And again, this is, this is enforced by the fact that you can't mutate data in the structs even though it's not invariant. We don't like this, but we have to do it. So here's an example for how this code actually ends up looking. Now this would be, this used to be quite painful. What we used to be able to have to do is we have to private int array underscore, private array, and then we'd write an accessor for it. We would do public array of int array, it make, make it const, it returns return ar this array underscore dub. This was, this was horrible. So what we, luckily what we changed to was this um, rather elegant, if I may say so myself, which I may not because it's my code, it's very improper to say that. <laughs> is UDA, very user-defined user -defined annotation, which um, basically just says, generate me an accessor. And later on, generate me a constructor, and generate me a to string, and generate me an op compare. This is, everything of this is abstracted away. You basically just have to tell the, tell the system what sort, of, uh, what sort of automatic methods you want in there, and they're provided for you, which is convenient. So basically using the information, the, the, the constructor generate this doesn't just generate a constructor. It also generates information that says what sort of fields the struct needs to be instantiated with and what sort of fields you can access. So essentially we're taking the struct and we're making its members private and then we're doing workarounds to make them public again. <laughs> it's a bit silly, but it works. In, compared, certainly compared to mutable, it, does, it actually does the job. Right, I already mentioned a bunch of that, so it's gonna be quick to get through here. The huge advantage of having protocol as a separate step, as a separate wrapper around the entire domain logic is that you can swap it out easily. Like we're using REST calls now. We didn't used to use REST calls. We used to use um, largely um, JSON RPC calls on, sta on, st on standing connections. And uh, switching from JSON RPC to REST was easy, it was very easy. Like if, if we had written our domain code embedded in a protocol where you'd actually explicitly make REST calls or explicitly make HTTP calls, you'd have to change all of that and you have to swap all of that around, it would have been painful. Due to the fact that control is a thin wrapper outside it, a protocol is a thin wrapper outside protocol, switching to REST was very much easier than it would have been in a more embedded protocol. More embedded framework, I'm sorry. Now, here's actually a huge advantage that is not, not obvious. The fact that all our model, all our model data is transparent. That is, it is, we can, you can enumerate the public fields, you can enumerate all the properties, and you can see their types, you can read them. The advantage of this is that if you have some domain data that needs to be passed to another service, all of this can be generated, all of this is generated. You just, you just write, call it, on the protocol layer, just call encode with your value, and it's automatically converted to very, very trivial JSON. And on the, again, because it structs, you don't get into problems with loops, you don't get any sort of um, recursive data structure issues, you just get a very, very clean JSON format that you can just dump on the network and decode back. Now, a huge point of this is that we don't use classes in model. But there's one use case where you, you traditionally use classes and it's um, when you have a field that wants to be one of a set of data types. Essentially what you would uh, traditionally use the visitor pattern for. Don't use the visitor, please don't use the visitor pattern for domain data. It's bad, it's wrong. What you want to be using is, um, not sure if I remember this, algebraic data types, right? Well, you want to be able to say like, I have one of five different types and I want to have one type that encapsulates all of them. Because the entire point, again, what's the, what's the point of OOP, of, of subtyping as compared to, in, to composition, it's that, you don't know what your types are going to be. 
You, you don't know what elements are going to be going into this possible set of data. But in this case, with the visitor pattern, then you say, yes, I do know. Yes, I do know. It's this, this, and this, and I want, to be, I want you as a visitor to be able to, to be called with all of them. You're essentially turning back around. You're saying, I'm going to take this one advantage of object-oriented programming. I'm going to throw it away. I'm going to discard it. That's pointless. It's silly. Don't do it. What you instead want to do is you want to specify, I have this type, I have this type, I have this type, and then I have a comp composite type that can be one of each of them. Right, just a so, small side trick there. Uh, going back to the actual talk, <laughs> at the control layer, this is where the main point of this talk comes into play. Uh, when, I talk, when I said process-based or object orientation, what I specifically mean is that at the control layer, we don't use classes to model state. We use, or specifically, you don't use classes to model business entities. We use classes to model business processes. What, this mean, what I mean by this is that if we, when you're asking a question like, when is the train going to arrive at a station? You don't have a class for the train. The train is a struct. You don't have a class for the station. The station is a struct. Because that is, this is all limited state. What you have a class for is the, the, the question, like the, the analysis of trains at stations. Trains, train station state, for instance. The advantage of this is that you're using very thin layers of object orientation. The only reason to use object orientation here at all is to abstract in between domain slices. For instance, if you have a protocol A on the left side, protocol B on the left side, you only want to, be, you only want to specify an interface of, of the sort of questions you want to ask of a station. And then on the other side, you just inherit that, and the, the protocol layer puts it all together into an application structure. So you, you just worry in each slice about the sort of, you, you implement the sort of um, APIs that the other parts of your program may be interested in. The advantage of this is that there are very few points where state can change. State can only change in the, pro in the process classes. So your threading becomes very simple. Your synchronization becomes very simple because you only have to synchronize at those points where state can change, and those points are just the process classes. Essentially, we are not afraid of, we are not afraid of threading. Usually, we have a lot of threads going around, and we have a lot more deadlocks than we have co corruption issues. We have basically not, have, not had any significant corruption issues for coming on a year now, as far as I can remember, because it is very easy to avoid corruption with this model because you're not changing anything except on those one or two points which are wrapped in synchronized blocks. Cheers. Uh, right, I think I already said that. Right, and a useful side effect of this, another useful side effect is that at the control layer, you basically have those few classes that implement the requirements that you're exposing to other layers or to other, to other slices of your domain, and everything else is functional code. Like, this lets you use ranges very, very, very heavily. We basically use ranges exclusively. There's one, our designer once said, I think every forge is a bug. And he reviews with that in mind. If you're writing a loop, he, he, he slaps you on the hand. He's like, why are you using a loop? Use an each, use a map. It's actually really good because you're avoiding a lot of, you're avoiding a lot of possible bugs that way. Basically, every time you would usually get into inconsistencies in, in, the, in your data flow, you usually get a compiler error instead. It's very nice. It's actually surprisingly memory efficient, too, because surprisingly many range operations don't actually allocate memory. This is, you'd think that functional programming would run into memory problems, would run into uncontrolled allocation problems. It's actually much cleaner because you, you don't have to create arrays all the time. You don't have to, to create appenders all the time. You can just build up your transformation and you can say, okay, just crank it. Just crank this chain of ranges and you'll be happy. You'll be, you, you get your data out at the end and then you can you create your new state, create a new model state and you can synchronize in one go. Makes testing easier too. Apropos synchronization, time for another rant. <coughs> Synchronized is a good idea, it's a very good, it's a very nice feature. The idea is you have a class and you can just mark it with synchronized class. And what this does is basically every method is synchronized and automatic, every public method is synchronized and when you call the method, you automatically grab a mutex and you do all your invariant checks and then you go into the main code and this is shared. Why is it shared? We don't know because the problem with this is the idea of it, uh, the idea of shared is that you're looking at data that may be in view from multiple threads uncontrolledly, essentially. And everything that is not directly under this, that is referenced, for instance, arrays, has to be shared, has to be shared in the current D approach because 
maybe this is in this area that was passed in from another thread. Maybe it's the other thread is going to mutate it. You don't know. You can't know. The problem with that is we don't want shared. We really don't want shared because it doesn't do, it, it doesn't do anything. Shared is at the moment pointless. What it does is it's a semantic annotation. It just says this code may be visible from other threads. You th should think about it. And you have to say, all right, I, sh I've, I thought about it. It's not, it's not visible. I'm going to cast that away. We don't want you to use cast. Cast is a sign that the compiler hasn't understood what we're doing. Cast is a sign that, a, that the compiler, we don't trust the compiler. The compiler says you can't do that. We say, yeah, I, I know compiler. I want to do it. It's okay. It's okay. But that's not good. That's not good because you don't get checks. You're losing all your checks. You're using all your type checks. You're, using, you're losing all your constancy checks. If you're casting to another type and you're casting away shared, but you're also casting away immutable, for instance, and you don't notice, that. the compiler doesn't tell you. It can't tell you. So we don't want, we don't want shared. We don't. On this one case alone, we've, decided, we've basically eschewed the use of synchronized classes, but we still needed synchronization. So every single pro control class that changes state has methods using synchronize this. The problem is now our invariants are completely boned. They are, it's hopeless. It's, it's completely hopeless. Let me give you an example. So this is how you would technically have to write code if you wanted to use synchronize this in a method. For instance, you have a, you have a value, and I'm, I'm going to pretend I write private. I wrote private in front of that. So what you usually want to be able to write is invariant value greater zero, just in, just as in Trivial clean format. The problem is that it's not synchronized. So you have to write invariant synchronize this asset value greater zero. And then in the decrement, you do the in condition, et cetera. This is redundant with the value. Ignore that. This is just an example of an in condition. Usually you check a parameter, of course. And again, you need to synchronize. And in the body, you need to synchronize the actual state change. And this still doesn't work. Let, let me be clear. This still doesn't work. The advantage of doing it this way is you don't get data corruption. That's all, that's all you're getting. You're not getting any sort of, of safety. You have, a, you have a chance, you even have a good chance of catching invariant violations. If you only have one thread running at a time, you're still, getting, you're still catching your invariant violations. But if you have two threads, you can, you can check your in invariant, and then you can check another method's invariant, and then you get into the body, and you've completely lost track of if your invariant is actually true. It's, it's, it's very hopeless. But the problem is, the, the advantage of doing it this way is you don't have to worry about shared. You don't have to do any weird casts. And it's, it's very much a situation of pick your poison. And I think the point of this is that we don't care about shared. We straight up don't care. We, we know we are in a class. We have private fields. We know these fields belong to us. We own that state. We own every method that mutates that state. We don't, we don't care about shared. We, we, are, we, don't, we care about authority. We, we want to be able to say this is our data. This is owned. The, the, nobody from outside can, can, can write any data to it, but we can. This is not the same as immutable. It's not even the same as, con as const. You want to be able to replace the data, but we want to be able to say we can only replace the data with data that in turn be owned, and we can't hand it out. And at that point, if you're having a synchronized method, it, it doesn't need shared, because it knows that it's the only one that's writing the data. Just something to think about. That's where, that's where you want to be, that's not where DS at the moment. That's some, but it's something that we wish that would be kept in mind when thinking about the shared rewrite. So, um, to summarize this, uh, we're actually, whoa, we're way below time. I've been talking way too fast. Okay. All right, whatever, you're gonna have a longer break. <laughs> <laughs> so, in summary, at the protocol layer, you can take very much advantage of the fact that your model is transparent, your model is plain old data, it's readable. Everything on the protocol layer can be generated. Everything on the protocol layer can be swapped out. It's very nice. On the control layer, this is the layer where object orientation, process-based object orientation comes into play. You have a small point of number of points where you change state. You have functional algorithms, you have range-based algorithms, and you have very coarse state transitions. What I mean by coarse is that the state of your program changes in one go. You go from one valid state to another valid state. At the model layer, using declarative typing, you're using, what I mean by declarative is the using these user-defined annotations, you're using um, read annotations, very, very, very seldom write annotations, and using um, invariants to guarantee that the state of your program matches what you're expecting from the domain that you get an error if you try to construct anything invaluable, in, 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 invalid. So in the classic object-orientated sense, you have classes that model entities, that model relations between entities, and that manage the mutation of the entity. In object orientation, the state doesn't belong to anyone. The state is public. Then, sorry, I put that wrong. The, the data is public. 
The state is owned by the control class, and it is updated in the, 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 sense of the way in which it's updated, the methodology is decoupled from the actual state change. This is the range-based logic. And <coughs> in summary, you get an object-oriented architecture. You use very, a very flat object orientation. You use declarative data types and you use functional algorithms in order to improve your expressiveness. All right, that's it. Thank you. Uh, as, a, as a final page, we have, um, a, I have a link up for the uh, boilerplate generation for accessors, constructors, to string, etc., cetera, and structs. I have a link up for our dependency visualization and checking framework. And by the way, we are hiring developers if you're willing to move to Munich. Very much looking around for that there. Thank you very much. Yo. Uh, questions? Yes, it looks like we've got 20 minutes go. for questions, so get asking everyone. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering why the control error uses runtime polymorphism instead of compile time. That's a very good question. I don't have a clean answer for that, but the background of this is that we've been somewhat tentative in introducing templates. Like, we are, again, we originally started up in very much a Java framework, so very much an object-oriented framework, and we have introduced templates in an isolated, in isolated way. We've introduced templates to, to handle the, 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 model, the modeling, the user-defined attributes. We've introduced templates to handle the protocol abstraction. We have not gotten around to thinking about templating at the control level yet. It's definitely a valid idea. It's going it's to make testing a slightly bit, slightly bit more difficult, potentially, but it's definitely something that's possible. Thanks. I had a question about how the problems you ran into using garbage collection in classes. So yeah. for, for those of us who haven't run into these problems yet, could you walk us through, like, what did you right, observe? How did you discover this problem? What should, right. should we be on the lookout for? Right, that's a very good question. And that's something that I really should have used more time to explain in the actual talk. So basically, the problem was that we, as a company, very much grew into the level of data where we ran into trouble. Basically, originally when we started out, we did not have any difficulty. We had problems, we had processes maybe using a few hundred megabytes, and we were very happy like allocating everything, absolutely everything all the time. And but then what happens is you deploy that code to production and you don't worry about it anymore. You just leave it running. There's, not, there's no significant bugs. You, don't, you may make a few fixes, but the code grows. You know, it grows and it grows on. And at some point, you notice that your process is now, has now run for two weeks and it's up to two gigabytes. And you still don't worry because that's normal. That's, that's okay, you have the memory for that. The problem is that you never really notice a point where the memory use becomes, where it becomes obvious that your fundamental design pattern has been crippling. You don't, uh, you don't run into a hard wall, you just run into, okay, maybe this is using a bit of memory, I should allocate more memory to the, to the to the virtual machine. But the thing is, you could have from this, we could have from the start used ranges, but the, this is very much something that you're not going to run into if you are writing D in a way that isn't dogmatically focused on classes, essentially. If you have a d development methodology where you're already open to using ranges, where you're already open to using structs, where you're already willing to say everything that can be a struct will be made a struct, you're not, basically not going to run into that issue unless you actually have the amount of data to justify this amount of memory use. This is really something that we ran into because we decided that objects were fine, we can use objects all the time, it's okay, and then at some point it, it's, it, it became less and less okay as the, the amount of domain data we had to worry about grew and as the amount of time that processes were running grew into days to weeks. So this is very much something that snuck up on us and that we only realized in hindsight. On a related note, wasn't there an issue with a, a network interruption uh, that was caused by GC collections? I don't actually know that. It's, it's unproven. Like, we're having, a, we're having an ongoing bug at the moment where we have some, uh, we have some long running tasks that you are now using uh, WebSocket connections in order to deliver notifications. And sometimes, like maybe once a day, maybe we are running into connection losses essentially. And we don't know why that is. I don't know, I actually know if this is the same problem if you're talking about, but it's definitely something that's affecting us acutely. And I think what may be happening is that we set the timeout to three seconds. And you'd think three seconds is a lot. But if you're, using, running, if you're running three gigabytes of memory and you are under CPU load, 
and you're running on a virtualized machine where maybe other processes are also stealing a lot of CPU time from you, it is not automatically impossible to me that you can hit the timeout by sheer coincidence. You can just, you probably can, your, your process can just go away for three seconds and not come back into user code until the time has already passed. I don't know if that's the case, but it's very much possible. Okay. So that, all, all I'm saying is give, you, give your networking code generous timeouts. It doesn't really hurt you. You talked about that you uh, was, were thinking about microservices for your art, architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, did you actually use that? Yeah. Uh, from the start, we used a, a network of interacting services over, the, over, over network connections between Docker containers. And the way that this works out in practice is that we have a separate folder that is reserved to specifying interfaces, essentially. That is reserved for specifying state that needs to be shared between a service and things that talk to it. And this is actually handled by git submodule, so you literally pull in that actual folder. It's convenient. Now, the point of that is that um, on, the, on the side that needs to talk to it, you really, on the protocol layer, you just instantiate an, well, I don't know, you just instantiate a client. On the other side, you just instantiate a service. So um, this makes it very easy to bring up uh, two services that need to talk to one another, can talk to one another in a straightforward way. And on the control layer, a, call between a REST call between two services looks exactly like a call between two domain slices. There's no practical difference. Now where we started out was with a model of microservices that was a bit too big. We had very, very monolithic, semi not exactly microservices, we basically had services. <laughs> no, no way it's called micro. And we ran into difficulties with restarting them because we had a lot of active state in each of the services that needed to be restored on every restart. And that made, that made our application very inflexible because it, took a, it, it still takes a lot of time to bring those services up to an operational state. Now, we are trying to switch to proper microservices, but it is my impression that we may have gone slightly too far in, uh, edging into nanoservice territory, <laughs> which is very much unpleasant. And even with the small amount of boilerplate we have, we still have a lot of infrastructural boilerplate to bring a new service up. And I think that does hurt us in that, in that sense. So we're trying to find a happy medium there, but it's very much a transition in progress. You said you had memory problems when you had your processes uh, running for a long period of time. Did you actually identify whether that is simply that you're building up a lot of memory that you're using, or is this some um, problem with false pointers or yeah. leaks or something? There are two separate issues that we ran into. The first one was an architectural one that we ran into with our XML modeling. Specifically, the issue was that every time we read an XML file, we wrote it into a class-based data structure where we had in each um, node of the XML tree a pointer to all children and a pointer to the parent. No, yeah, those of you who know data structures and garbage collectors are realizing the problem now. And there are always going to be some false pointers in the program. The issue is with an architecture like that, with a tree layout like that, every single false pointer anywhere in your XML tree holds the entire tree alive. Everything connected to it, all the, all the text data that you've just read, is everything, all of it is alive. That was painful. So a lot of, those, a lot of that overhead went away when we switched to manually freeing every um, XML tree after we were done with it. But we could, only, we could only do that because we didn't keep any XML state alive past the point where we had done the passing. And this is another benefit of the separation between protocol and control. Because by the time you're done with your XML tree, you're done serializing it into your application, you are really done. You can very much be confident that all of that can be freed. And that is very much an advantage that we took advantage of to reduce like, memory use. A second problem that I am not sure about, that was never properly debugged, but that I have my suspicions about, is D does not have precise stack scanning. It is going to take a while, actually, to get precise stack scanning. And I think the issue why we had false pointers, and again, this is a suspicion. This is not guaranteed. I think what happened is, in a multi-threaded program, you have somewhere in your call tree, you have a pointer to your XML tree. And this is, this is an address on the stack. And maybe that function returns, and then it calls another function, and that other function happens to be using a line data, for instance, and it has a hole in the stack frame at that point. So at that stage, your pointer is never going away while the second function is running, and that can be a very long-running function. It's just, it's just going to hang around literally forever, and it's going to keep everything, everything in that XML tree alive forever. And at some point, maybe that function is going to return, and maybe that field is going to be overwritten, but this is not something you can really count on. And 
D is not at the point where if we had accurate heap scanning and if we had accurate stack scanning, that would not be an issue. And I think we would then be at a point where we could actually be confident that everything that can be freed will be freed, but D is not at the moment there yet. I guess uh, you could just, you could zero out yeah, that's things actually on, what the, we ended on, up on the way out and see if it changes. That is what we ended up doing and that did help. Uh, the problem with that is that <laughs> We didn't, we didn't end up keeping the code because it is very much weird code and it very much needs to be documented a lot. And we, didn't, we actually didn't end up needing it after we decided to manually free the XML tree at, that, at the point we were done with it. So, but it is very much something that we tried and that did help. All right, we have a question from Discord here. Jin Shil asks, how is Funk work managing language, in, language changes such as deprecations and uh, what is their feeling about gradual language changes? I am so glad you asked. <laughs> okay, first of all, we are very much trying to keep our services at a level where everything is rather relatively current. We usually pick a compiler version. The last one was, I think, 2.82.1, where we're confident that we're going, we're going to take this version, we're going to stay at it for maybe half a year. And we're going to play around with newer versions if we need a specific newer feature. And we're going to try to get our library code up to date to the new versions as soon as possible. But generally, we're going to keep most of our services at a level, when we don't have a problem, we're going to keep it at the level, and we're just going to keep going with it. But usually every half year or so, uh, there's a service actually I've written for the, for the company where, because every, every version is tracked and every version that we're pulling in is in a, in a universal format, like for instance, we have DAP or we have Git externals or we have some other specification files that, de that define how we are pulling in additional dependencies from the artifactory, for instance. And all of those let us enumerate how many possible versions there are and what the current version is. So there's a page you can go to and you can straight up look up what, what service is at what level of updatedness. You can, you can see if a service is outdated because it's going to be marked in a very angry red. And it's going, going, basically going to tell you, the, the way that works is whenever you're making a change to a service, the service moves to the top of the queue. So if you're looking at the front page of the service, you're going to see, all right, this, this, and this service has been recently changed, and it's very outdated. Maybe you should bring it up to date, hint, hint. And that I think that tries, we, try to make, we try to push developers to, to say, when you're making a change to the service, if it's not so outdated that bringing it up to date would be more painful than actually making the change. And that does definitely happen for very old services. But if it's not too outdated, the first thing you should do is bring everything up to the current standard run the tests, see if everything works, and then do your actual domain task. So this is definitely something we're very aggressive about. About the second half of your question about language changes, we are hurt so much more, so much more by bad features than we are by changes. If there's something in the language that is hindering progress, that is causing ongoing bugs, please, for the love of God, change it, break it, break our code. And we want you to break our code in, if it's in the interest of making the language better. Please, very much please. In, in my own interest, by the way, anytime, you're, anytime you decide to remove alias get this and nullable, I will buy you a beer. I don't even drink beer, I will buy you one. That, is, that, that single bug has cost us so many hours. If, if you're ever worried about removing that because of legacy code, please, in our, for our sake, don't. So I see you used shared. Do you use it in production? And uh, if it weren't there, would you be unhappy? Um, I'd be using what, please? Shared. Synchronized. Oh, we're not using shared. We are very much avoiding the use of shared, primarily because we're scared of it. I was and speaking about synchronized. Oh, yeah, synchronized in production. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the second half of your question, please? Do you use it in production, question yeah. one? And uh, would you be unhappy if it weren't there? Uh, shared and uh, synchronized and specific. <sighs> That's a hard question. Uh, we're using synchronized to the extent that we are basically uh, using it as a wrap around mutex lock and mutex unlock. If it were not there, we would have to go back to explicit uh, super types with uh, automatic mutexes, which is something that I think with the proto object was already considered. And this is very much a transition that we would very much not exactly like to make, but we would very much be open to making. And the problem with synchronized is that I'm not sure if a scope-based solution is more legible. Synchronized is a, synchronized this in specific is a 
a statement that you can very much see what it does. You can very much see what amount of code is covered by it. And if you're using a scoped struct, for instance, a scope autolog, for instance, this would be more convenient to write in certain sense, but very much harder to understand. So I do think there's value in being able to uh, write a declaration that just says to say, this block of code is covered by a mutex. And, but that is not inherently something that needs to be in the language as a dedicated statement. I think, for instance, if there was a version of with that called a function on entry and called a function on exit, that would be very much an adequate replacement for us. All right, are there any other questions? Nope, nothing. All right, then I guess that's everything. Give a round of applause.